Eating or drinking anything at all before any type of procedure involving anesthesia is strictly forbidden. Ingesting so much as a single gummy bear, one of my personal favorite snacks on call, is enough to have a surgery canceled. My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And in this video, I explain why eating or drinking before surgery is such a big deal and what we do in the case of unanticipated emergency surgery. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. The title of this video is actually not clickbait. There was a large study done in the UK which found that over half of deaths related to airway complications and anesthesia were attributed to pulmonary aspiration. And at the end of the day, pulmonary aspiration is the risk that is increased when we're talking about eating or drinking before anesthesia. Before we get too far, I do just need to point out that this video does not provide medical advice. It's just a YouTube video. If you need medical advice, go talk to your doctor. To understand what pulmonary aspiration is and why it can become a life-threatening event, one has to understand the relationship between the GI tract, the lungs, and anesthesia. So let's say we've got our patient here. This is um, Mitch. And here's Mitch's esophagus that leads all the way down to his stomach. In between the esophagus and the stomach is a sphincter that's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And that's an important protective mechanism to prevent gastric contents from going from the stomach up through the esophagus. Another important part of Mitch's anatomy is his trachea or windpipe, which is located anterior to the esophagus. The trachea eventually leads to the lungs as represented by these dotted lines, lungs and trachea. When Mitch is not anesthetized, he has a number of mechanisms in place to prevent anything from going down the trachea that shouldn't go down the trachea. That includes the epiglottis, the arytenoid, and the vocal cords, which are roughly located right here. These structures and the innervation in the trachea provide for airway reflexes that allow Mitch to cough and also swallow, which are both protective mechanisms against anything being aspirated into the trachea. But now let's say that Mitch is anesthetized. Good night, Mitch. Part of being anesthetized means having diminished or even completely absent airway reflexes. So we can say goodbye to this line that represents the airway reflexes. In this anesthetized state, if there are any gastric contents, there is a much higher risk that they could pass up through the lower esophageal sphincter, which is now relaxed, and then into the trachea because there are no reflexes that are protecting the trachea. And eventually those contents could make their way down into the patient's lungs. Once there, any sort of aspirated contents has the potential to lead to a life-threatening infection. And this is the perfect place to illustrate where exactly an endotracheal tube goes, which is through the mouth into the trachea, and in the trachea, the cuff on the endotracheal tube is inflated so as to prevent anything from passing into the trachea. That is what we refer to as a secure airway, which is an anesthesiologist's best friend. Just to really illustrate the point of how long food can stick around in the stomach, I brought this ultrasound into the operating room with me to see if we can find any evidence of the lunch that I ate four hours ago. Let's see what we can find. Technically, patients should be laying down for a gastric ultrasound, but I'm just freestyling it in here. Let's just go for it. Just kidding, we're not freestyling. This is incredibly difficult to do sitting up. We're gonna lay down. I won't lie, this is actually a fairly comfortable configuration. I need to propose a new chair setup for the operating rooms. So we'll start by scanning the right side of my abdomen to look for the left lobe of the liver, which looks like we found it here. And we'll keep on moving over to the left and the antrum of the stomach should bring itself into view. And that is what we are looking at right in the middle of the screen. I'm continuing to scan to the left. And as you can see, my stomach is filled with, well, it doesn't look like its original form, but yes, this is four hour old pizza. It doesn't quite look as appetizing as when I first ate it. 
Anyways, gastric ultrasound can be a useful clinical tool for determining whether there are any gastric contents before you induce anesthesia. This is actually a research area that's actively being studied by doctors Mark Sherwin and Dan Katz here at Mount Sinai Hospital. All right, well, I should get up before someone walks into the operating room. It'd be awkward. Depending on the dose, the majority of anesthetic agents can lead to decreased lower esophageal sphincter tone and or loss of airway reflexes, thereby significantly increasing the risk of pulmonary aspiration. Even if the primary anesthetic plan is to just administer two liters of oxygen by nasal cannula and no other medications whatsoever, we still always have general anesthesia as a backup plan in the event that there's some kind of emergency. And however unlikely it may be that we'll need to convert to general anesthesia, we need to be able to do that safely, and that means not having had anything to eat or drink before the procedure. For that reason, it's actually a common misconception that if there's gonna be a procedure, but the patient's only gonna be very mildly sedated, that it's okay to have something to eat or drink. It's definitely not okay because even a mild amount of sedation can decrease lower esophageal sphincter tone, blunt airway reflexes, or if we need to convert to general anesthesia, then we definitely need to make sure that the patient is appropriately fasted. In cases of emergency surgery, then of course we'll bring a patient back to the operating room and anesthetize them even if they're not appropriately fasted. And the decision to do that really just comes down to weighing the benefits versus the risk. So for an emergency, the risk that we're weighing is that of pulmonary aspiration, and the benefit that we're weighing is going back to the operating room as soon as possible to address whatever surgical emergency brought the patient to the operating room to begin with. In these cases of emergency surgery, there is one strategy that's frequently employed to at least theoretically reduce the risk of pulmonary aspiration. And this is called an RSI, which stands for rapid sequence intubation or rapid sequence induction or rapid sequence induction and intubation, depending on who you ask. Basically, the concept with an RSI is that you go as quickly as possible from pushing your induction dose of anesthesia to having an advanced airway in place, meaning an endotracheal tube with the cuff that's inflated on the end. This provides airway protection. The contrast to an RSI is just a standard induction, which is often characterized by taking some time after pushing the induction medication to make sure that you can mask ventilate a patient before attempting to intubate them. For a patient who's appropriately fasted, it should be safe to mask ventilate them without an endotracheal tube in place. However, for someone who's not appropriately fasted, then this is a time where there's an extremely high risk of aspiration. Given that we have the ability to do an RSI, the question becomes, why not just let everyone eat and drink before surgery and then we can just RSI everybody so we don't have to put them through the discomfort of fasting beforehand. The reality is that an RSI is not a particularly reliable way to ensure that a patient won't have an aspiration event on induction of anesthesia. And this is borne out in the literature and in fact, there's a recent study that demonstrates that not only does RSI not have any effect on the outcome as far as pulmonary aspiration is concerned, but RSI actually increases the amount of time that it takes to intubate a patient. That's probably because the pressure applied to a patient's neck during an RSI can actually distort the view during intubation. So for now at least, RSI seems to be standard practice for intubating patients who are not appropriately fasted, but I suspect that as time goes on, it is possible that we might just see RSIs go away because they really haven't been demonstrated to be effective. Current practice guidelines from the American Society of Anesthesiologists says that clear liquids are okay for up to two hours prior to surgery not including alcohol. A light meal or non-human milk is okay up to six hours prior to surgery. And a full meal should not be had less than eight hours prior to surgery. There are a lot of nuances to these recommendations and there are a number of different pathologies that patients can have, for example, significant diabetes, that can significantly alter the amount of time that it takes for the stomach to truly empty. It's probably for that reason that many hospitals just adopt the practice of asking patients to not have anything to eat after midnight the day prior to surgery. Again, this video is not medical advice, and so if you do have questions about this, I encourage you to speak with your own doctor. If you enjoyed this video, check out this video where I walk through all of the drugs that are typically used as part of a general anesthetic. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.